This Veterans History Project interview is being conducted on September the 21st, September the 24th on Monday in the year 2018 here at the Niles Main District Public Library upstairs in the third floor boardroom. My name is uh, Neil O'Shea, I'm a member of the reference staff here and uh, I'm privileged uh, to be charged with the Veterans History Project and it's uh, uh, my good fortune today to be sitting across the table from uh, Korea War veteran uh, Mr. Peter J. Smith. Correct. Thank you for coming in today, Mr. Smith, and thank you for your service. Uh, accompanying Mr. Smith today is his son, Tim, who uh, arranged for this interview today through uh, Northwest Side Irish American uh, Community um, Organization, uh, which maintains an awareness of events here in the Niles Library District. Good morning, Mr. Smith. So, um, Mr. Smith, can you recall when you entered the service? I enlisted December 31st, 1950. And where were you living at that time? Uh, in Chicago. You want the address? The north, north side, probably? Northwest side. Yeah. Roughly Laramie and Fullerton. Laramie and Fullerton. Um, you were, you were born uh, in, Chicago. in Chicago in 1931, 31. so at the age of your um, enlistment, you would have been 19 or 19. 19. Yeah. What, had, what, what had you been doing at the time, during that time, say, I suppose from high school to? I was in college at DePaul University on a swim scholarship. And... Uh, How it all began goes back to June of 50 when the Korean War started. My buddy and I, who uh, he happened to be a tenant in my dad's building, and uh, we both decided we should do something in the military but we didn't want to be in the Army. So we both decided the Coast Guard would be for us. We had both worked for the Park District at the Rainbow Fleet, which was a training school to teach people how to sail. We had each spent a summer there running the crash boat. So we went to the Coast Guard recruiter who was in the old post office building at the time. And the chief there must have been 50 years old, had probably spent most of his life in the Coast Guard, interviewed us extensively and then apologized that he couldn't take us in because they had a waiting list of 17 months. So we went back to school, swam at school, and played water polo at the park. The water polo, co the water polo coach at the park was a former Marine pilot he was going to school mornings and working afternoon and evenings at the park. And he suggested to me sometime in December to look into the Marine Squadron at the Glenview Naval Air Station. So New Year's Eve day, I went out there used his name, and enlisted. Went back to school, and eight days later, the 8th or 9th of January, I opened a letter from the Marine Corps that said I was on extended active duty. So, at that point, 
I knew that I couldn't finish that semester at school, so I quit school and went to work at a local factory uh, that I, uh, the name will come to me, but their their product was uh, baking good, baking pans, and I was an order picker, putting stuff on on a skid and having it shipped out. March first was the first day of boot camp. And Dan, if I can interject, wasn't part of the reason because you actually enlisted in the reserves, correct? Yeah. With the thought, not the, not the promise, but with the thought and an implicit promise that you probably would be able to complete your semester. Yeah. But they, but they activated you eight days later. Well, uh, the first day of boot camp was very interesting. They. Uh, they ran a special boot camp at Glenview Naval Air Station. There were approximately 60 of us in boot camp, two platoons of 30 each. They brought in some regular Marine drill instructors who put us through the, the usual paces, and one of the things that came to mind right away, I was able to obey orders because I had been in Catholic schools, uh, had nuns, brothers, priests tell you what to do, and you did it. Some of the people were very put off with being told what to do. So uh, the boot camp lasted about six weeks, and then we were kept at Glenview doing sort of busy work. And then the name of the squadron changed from VMF to VMA because somehow the government decided that they wanted attack planes rather than fighter planes. So uh, at this point, my military occupational spell specialty was rifleman, 0300. We were shipped out to the West Coast and uh, to El Toro. My first impression of El Toro is over the gateway was a photo reconnaissance plane and a uh, sort of a history of the plane saying it cost $2 million. <laughs> so my first duty at El Toro was mess duty for a month. And the uh, commissary officer in charge of feeding the troops happened to be from a family that ran a chain of cafeterias in St. Louis. So he knew what he was doing. And he bragged a lot about he was able to feed the men at something like under a dollar a day, something like 98 cents a day, when the average was $1.25. So after mess duty, I was asked if I had any skills and the Sergeant in charge of the motor pool asked if I could drive a truck. I said yes. So he gave me a dump truck and said, go out to the stables 
with your dump truck and about four loads a day of manure were put in my dump truck and I took it over to a field and put it in front of a manure spreader. After I had cleaned up all the manure, he asked if I would like to drive a semi. So I said, I'll give it a try. So this was an open air bus sort of an affair where everybody stood up and I was driving the tractor and I was driving it around the base and then returning it to the motor pool, I took a turn too sharp and put the wheels of the trailer in, a, in the, the drainage ditch. So he said, you're out. <laughs> At that point, I returned to the barracks and a friend of mine from the barracks who I was new to me was a carpenter and he said I'll make you and a carpenter's helper I thought this was a great idea so he took me to the carpenter shop and I did some menial things like cut boards uh, nail a few things together and finally uh, He said, we have to uh, pack up some things to go overseas. So in the shed, or in a different shed, was a piece of equipment that I inquired, what is this equipment? And somebody said, it's a still. If there's nothing to drink over there, we're going to make our own. But in about the same time, I was went to the the base tavern, if you want to call it, and there was a girl from DePaul University there who saw me and said, "How would you like to be transferred to the base squadron and be on the swim team?" And I said, "This is not." we're going overseas and she said I'll arrange it so the next morning at muster I was called in to our commanding officer who said what are you trying to pull off I said it's not my idea sir I'm I was pushed into this situation so he said the uh, athletic director of the base outranks me so he's got you till we go overseas which happened to be about two and a half weeks but the funny thing about the swim team I was temporarily assigned to the base squadron but stayed in our own barracks and my job was to mop an area in the barracks every morning be at the swim pool at 10.30 till noon doing some physical exercise and swimming and then come back at 2.30 till about 4 o'clock doing some physical exercise and swimming. We were in two swim meets that I can recall one was at our pool and the other one was at a Navy base at Treasure Island. So we were told we're going overseas. You're off the base squadron. You're now back in our squadron. And I still had no, I was still a rifleman. There was no, no way I was anything but so the uh, at this point we were merged there was three squadrons ours a one from Grosseal Michigan and one from Nebraska and they uh, they made one squadron out of us and 
a lot of people were transferred to, to carriers and so forth. But I was told at that time that there was an opening in flight safety equipment. So the sergeant in charge of flight safety equipment was a fellow by the name of Jim Bolton. He was a master sergeant. And he interviewed me and said, you'll do fine. So we now transferred from El Toro by train to San Diego. At San Diego, we were billeted alphabetically. And there was three Smiths together. The other two Smiths were from Texas. One made fun of Texas, and the other was a typical Texan who thought Texas was the greatest thing in the world. The one who made fun of Texas had been a straw boss at the rodeo, and one of his riders had joined the Marine Corps. He gave a party for him, got drunk, and wound up in the Marine Corps. So he was a hell raiser from, from the beginning. But he was a radio, his first enlistment, uh, he went to radio school and became a radio repairman. So he was our radio repairman in the squadron. And before we were to ship out, the tavern outside the base was called Humphreys. And a lot of us would go there to drink just to get off the base. So the owner of Humphreys wanted us to have a mascot. So he gave us his dog, a Doberman, by the name of Humphrey. And as we were ready to board the ship, we saw that the ship had a mascot, a boxer. So we got aboard the ship, and when we went under, when we got underway. Humphrey got seasick, but that's part. That's later. <laughs> Our first meal on the ship was rabbit, and our next day's meal, breakfast, was oatmeal and beans. Again, I was put on mess duty. But this time, I was billeted with ship's company. So I had a mattress, sheets, a locker, and freshwater showers. So I was in great shape. And the chief in charge of the mess hall was a black fellow, black chief by the name of Wade. Very great guy to work for. He knew what he was doing and treated everybody fairly. Uh, so this fellow that was in the bunk above me was regular Navy for many years. And the first thing he asked me was, do you want a drink? <laughs> and I said, I don't want any of that torpedo juice that blinds people. He says, no, this is good Canadian whiskey that I bring aboard in Listerine bottles. So he gave me a drink in a paper cup, but that was the, the only drink I had out of his bottle. But going back to uh, Chief Wade, he said, there are a lot of jobs in this mess hall uh, that require some skill, some no skill, some are good, some are bad. You're going to be rotated around and have and do everything. So halfway across, we, we were on the, the USS Sitco Bay. And a transport carrier, planes did not fly off of this. They were just moved around on it. Uh, Humphrey died. He was on IVs in the sick bay for <laughs> about nine or ten days. So we had a burial at sea, which was very impressive. 
uh, draped in a flag with the guns, and, uh, and we had a, uh, the chaplain was a Protestant chaplain, and he said a few prayers, and Humphrey was dropped, wrapped in chains, so he was sunk to the bottom. When we got about a day out of Osaka, Chief Wade said, find yourself a buddy who likes the same kind of pie that you do, and then I'll bake a pie that you can split, pumpkin, apple, cherry, peat, whatever, blueberry. So I found a guy who liked the cherry pie, so we ordered a cherry pie, and the next thing he announced is you're going to have a meal in the officer's wardroom and you're going to have your pie. So we land in Osaka, Japan, and uh, we had liberty, but there was port side, starboard side, I don't know which side I was on, but I was on the second, second liberty, the second day. When I was ready to go off the ship, one of the drill instructors from the past at Glenview gave me a uh, receipt for some shirts that he had cleaned and pressed at a Japanese cleaners. He says, will you pick these up for me? They're paid for. So I went off and I was carrying these shirts around and I went to two or three taverns, had a few beers, and then it was getting close to curfew and I had to get back to the ship by midnight. So I went to a, uh, I saw a rickshaw and I said, how much will it take, what will you charge me to get back to the shipyard? And he said something like $10 American. I thought, this is terribly expensive and I'm not sure that I want to pay that much. But I got in the rickshaw, he took me to the gate, and I jumped out of the rickshaw and ran in, leaving the shirts in the rickshaw. So somehow or another, he explained to the guard that he had to get to the ship and get these shirts to somebody and get his money. So the next morning, uh, Sergeant Grislak grabbed me out of my bunk and said, what the hell did you do last night? So I explained it to him and he says, well, you're on a report. You've got a report to the duty officer and explain your situation. He says, you might be court-martialed. So I reported to the duty officer, and he sort of laughed and says, get the hell out of here. But Grizzlick had paid the rickshaw driver, so I owed Grizzlick. So now I'm there. At this point, our planes are transferred inland to an air bay, an, uh, uh, a, well, let's see, an air force air base called Itami, and our planes are gone over by our mechanics and the manufacturer of the planes, which is Douglas. So for a week, our mechanics are learning from the manufacturer's mechanics how to handle these planes. And we were just given busy work, just do something. So about a week later, we get a call, or we're, we're notified at muster be on the flight line at $2,100 with your sea bag packed. So we show up and we're transported to Korea. 
to a base called K3, which is not yet finished. The CBs are working on it. And the CBs, I, I learned, I have all the respect in the world for these guys. They know what they're doing, and they do a good job. So we get to Korea about 2 in the morning. The commander of the base welcomes us aboard and says, the mess hall is open, steak and eggs for breakfast. So I'm in line with a steak on my tray. My eggs are floating in about 4 inches of grease. And the fellow behind me says to the cook, are those eggs fresh? Now, this is October 51. And the cook sort of laughs and says, I've been in the Corps since 39, and these eggs were here before me. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my introduction. <laughs> so after that, uh, we, we didn't have Quonset huts. The Seabees were in the process of building Quonset huts for us, but we had tents. And they, they broke us into groups of four of all the same rank. And they took us to these spots where your tent was with the four guys, and one of the Seabees would assist us in erecting the tent and putting the furniture, the bunks in it, and so forth. So uh, the next day, I reported to what was tentatively called the parachute loft. But it wasn't the loft, because we didn't have a loft that was necessary to dry parachutes. They had to be dried once a month. So they had to go to Japan once a month to be dried and repacked. So the sergeant in charge of what we called the loft took us on a tour. We went to sick bay. We went to the quartermaster. We went to the motor pool. And he elaborated on what we could do for them, what could they do for us. So it was trading. And I was given a Jeep with a trailer that had five or six master cylinders of oxygen. And my job was when the planes came back to check the oxygen level and bring it up to the required level, which just required a wrench and uh, turning a uh, turning a uh, a knot. In ad addition to that, uh, a lot of the planes had a uh, a problem when they were starting. The fuel leaks would ignite, and there would be a sort of a flash fire. So there was a fire bottle that was activate, activated from the pilot's seat to uh, put the fire out in the engine. And if the fire bottle had been used, I had to replace it. So uh, my job was quite easy. Wait until the planes came in bring the oxygen up to the level of it was. And then the Jeep was mine for the rest of the day if I wanted to do anything. So we finally resolved that uh, there was a, a bishop from France who had started an order of nuns. So it became sort of my job with the guys that I was with to take the laundry to the nuns, pay them to do it, and bring it back to the guys. We didn't have to do any laundry. But over the next 
three weeks or so, the Quonset huts were built. Were built, and we were, I think, eight or ten of us to a hut. And in the evening, after chow, they opened up a saloon, if you want to call it that, and all the beer you could drink, a nickel a can. If you wanted European beer, it was a dime. <laughs> so uh, at the close of the slop shoot, as it was called, you could take all the beer you wanted out, but it had to be opened. There was a Mexican kid who was in our outfit, and I think he was in ordinance probably. He would always bring about three or four cans back to the hut and have a can or two before breakfast. So uh, this was October, just before Thanksgiving. I was assigned to R&R &R at Nara, Japan. And Nara was a, an R&R &R hotel that was run by either the USO or special services of the Army or so forth. So on R&R, &R, I went with a friend of mine from service by the name of Bill Raiden. He was south side Chicago, uh, worked for a local newspaper as a photographer and reporter, and uh, stayed in journalism all his life. Uh, in later years, he became the 10 o'clock news out of Maumee, Ohio. But I lost track of him when he left Chicago. But Bill and I discovered when we were at Nara that there was a, a better place to eat than the, the Nara Hotel. There were two Japanese steakhouses, one called the River Grill and one called the Fuji Grill, and they were on opposite sides of a river. And these were steakhouses, I think, who specialized in this milk-fed beef was, you know, a great deal. You get a, you get a meal for two bucks American. And we would have after a meal, more than our share of after-dinner drinks. <laughs> and I can, all, I can always remember Bill's commentary was, I'm fully cognizant. I'm, <laughs> I'm fully cognizant. <laughs> so uh, we go back, and uh, there, there are four of us in the, in the loft, so each week, one of us has to escort about a dozen parachutes to Japan to be repacked. We were supposed to be involved in the repacking, but there were so many guys there doing it that the sergeant in charge says, just get lost. So we would, for the, for the three or four days in Japan, we were sort of on our own. So this is, and, this uh, is after R&R, &R. in other the, words, uh, this is part of your regular duty. Mm -hmm. The fellow in charge of our shop or loft, Sergeant Bolton, was a, besides what he was doing militarily, he could make uh, clothing. So his wife would send him pictures of a dress that she wanted. And while we were in Japan, there was a, a fabric shop that he would tell us to go to and pick up so many yards of a certain fabric 
and he would pay us later. So that was every four weeks you had three or four days in Japan. And finally, the, uh, the officer in charge of our loft, uh, followed by the name of Bo a captain from Detroit by the name of Boudreaux, was, had his number of flights in. So he was sent to Japan, and he became the operations officer at this field at Atami. And so I would go to him when I was there and ask if I could get on a training flight or something just to see what Japan looked like. And a couple of times he'd get me on a short training flight. But what, what, what happened was the pilot was in training and he was constantly doing landings. So <laughs> it would be... <laughs> fly around for about two minutes, land, take off, fly around. So that got to be something that wasn't useful to me anymore. So I asked him about getting a ride in a helicopter, and he refused. He says, they're all nuts, so you don't, you don't do that. So it got to be New Year's Eve again of 1951. And uh, we shared the base with the photo squadron that had, uh, what's the, well, Ted, Ted Williams. Ted Williams was there. And John Glenn. And so was Glenn. John Glenn, yeah, they were wingmen. Well, I didn't know who these guys were, but photo squadron started shooting their rifles or whatever weapons they had at midnight, sort of celebrating the new year. And I was in bed probably at 10.30 or 11. And about 2 o'clock, a captain came in. His name was Collins, who I knew from talking to him at his plane when he came back. He asked where my rifle was. And I sort of groggily said, I don't know, sir. Yeah, well, he, what do you mean you don't know where your rifle is? So eventually I said, it's under my cot. So we pulled it out. He opened it. He says, well, he sniffed it. He said, it hasn't been fired and it hasn't been cleaned. So it will be presented to me at 0800 hours clean and ready for use. Yes, sir. So I get the rifle to him at 8 o'clock in the morning, and he gives me a lecture about bosses. He says, bosses in civilian life, you have some good bosses and some bad bosses. Military life, it's the same way. We happen to have a bad boss here. <laughs> he wanted everybody who fired their weapons to be busted down one rank. So I don't know how many there were, but Captain Collins says, keep your rifle clean. <laughs> so from then on, I, I just covered it with something. <laughs> but uh, going on into the new year, uh, our chaplain, who was from that town in Massachusetts where they had the submarine fleet. He, he, the story goes that he was too young. This is a Navy chaplain. The, he, he was too young to be a chaplain in the military, but his uncle was the head of the Navy chaplains, so he pushed him into it. And he had arranged to have the bishop say a pontifical mass at our chapel. So I was an altar server, but there was no problem with language because it was all Latin anyway. But uh, 
The story goes, <clears throat> who was ever in charge of the bishop wanted him to return to France, retired. He decided to stay in Korea and continue his, whatever you want to call, missionary work. So, uh, going on into the new year, uh, it was still every four weeks, one of us, or every week, one of us would go to Japan with parachutes to be great. And then uh, somewhere around March, we were transferred to a, a different base that was close to Seoul. It was called K-6. And uh, so now our planes had a shorter distance to do what they were supposed to do. And our plane's job was, as they called it, rail cuts, destroy a railroad track, or bomb bridges, knock bridges out. And if they got to whatever the target area was, and uh, through fog or some reason they couldn't get their bombs off, they were called in for close air support for the troops. And they would, whatever the close air support uh, man would, would do, they would do. Now, while all this was going on, there were planes on aircraft carriers. And every once in a while, the planes on the aircraft carriers couldn't unload their ordnance. A bomb got hung. And the, the, the order was, you don't take bombs back to a ship. So they would come to our field, and on several occasions, they would drop from the uh, from the wing, and s some of them were armed, and they'd explode maybe a hundred yards behind the plane, and CBs would come out and repair that right away. So. They would always come back in pairs. Whoever had hung ordnance would have a wingman. And then they would probably have a cup of coffee and maybe some extra gas or something to get back to the carrier. And they would give us a sort of a thank you salute, which amazed me at about 30 or 35 feet above the ground. They're flying at 300 miles an hour. If one of them sneezed, they'd be out of business. But while we were at K-6, this lasted, say, late March into early June. And we were being relieved. So we went back to the States. Uh, I'll go back to Glenn Smith. The, the, the crazy cowboy. Uh, he was on R&R &R and stole a Japanese fire engine. So he was locked up in a Japanese jail and our executive officer, a fellow by the name of Fuller, Captain Fuller, was an attorney from Texas. So he had to go to Japan and plead for Glenn's release and promise that he would be chastised or punished in some way equal to what the Japanese were going to do. Whether this ever happened or not, I don't know. On the way back, on the, uh, the ship was the Willy White, William Weigel. Uh, Captain Fuller was a passenger with us, and uh, I had 
maybe three blankets stolen off my bunk. And each time that one was stolen, I would go to Captain Fuller, and he would sign it a pass that I could get another blanket. So finally, after the third one, he said, Smitty, you're on your own. I've done three. You're finished. So from then on, I just somehow or another stuffed the blanket into my sea bag and took it out at night. We got back to San Diego, and uh, eight to ten of us were called out and were told we had internal parasites and we were to go undergo treatment for these internal parasites for the next 10 days. So uh, we didn't have any, any duty except to take the pills. So could sleep in, breakfast, was served to us till 10 o'clock in the morning. Uh, one thing we did, we crashed a wedding somewhere along the line. I don't know. We got into the wedding somewhere uh, north of San Diego. Uh, and uh, at the end of the treatment, we were to uh, poop in a box and have it examined, and if you were free of the parasites, you could go home. Well, one of the fellows was convinced he still had the parasites, but he wanted to go home, so he asked me to poop in his box. <laughs> <laughs> so the, the next thing was uh, we are ready to be discharged, and they, uh, they give us travel pay. I think it, it amounted to about $112, which was the price of an air, airline ticket from San Diego to Chicago. Four of the guys decided they didn't want to fly. They pooled their money and bought an old Chrysler. And we're going to drive home in this about 100 miles out of San Diego. The fuel pump went. And the story goes it only cost them eight bucks a piece to have the fuel pump redone. And when they got back to Chicago, they sold the car for half of what they paid for it. But that was an adventure that I turned down. I, uh, I flew, I think, TWA back to Midway. But when I, uh, I called a cab from the base to the airport, and the cab driver pulled up. This was a female who I, I'm ready to lift my sea bag. She grabbed my sea bag and another bag I had. She was stronger than any woman I had ever seen. You know, threw them in the, in the cabin, and I was off and back home. So that's uh, the end of my story. I uh, planned for a wedding. So from July, the wedding was going to be in October. And uh, looking for work, I went back to the park district and uh, was offered a job as a lifeguard and took it. And again, worked the north ledge of Oak Street Beach. But at this time, the uh, Illinois Athletic Club had a water polo team. 
and they were competing for a place in the 52 Olympics. So a lot of us were shifted over to the Illinois Athletic Club after work to scrimmage this team that was competing for the Olympics. And our deal was a great steak dinner at the Illinois Athletic Club two or three nights a week. But then uh, I left, got married, and uh, eventually went to work for household finance as a uh, <laughs> you call uh, manager tra manager trainee, and uh, after about two years, I was offered, or they offered me a transfer to Coffeyville, Kansas. I said I got to check this out with my wife. My wife said, absolutely no way would we go to Coffeyville, Kansas. So I reported that the next day, and Household Finance paid me and gave me two weeks' pay in lieu of notice. I had more cash than I had ever had in my life. So I wound up at Temple Steel. Uh, as the employment manager and sort of safety manager of a metal stamping plant. My boss was the personnel manager who was a uh, Navy chief. So Navy chief, Marine sergeant, we had established who the authority was. But uh, while at Temple Steel, I, I was there for about nine years. Uh, and every time I could get a raise, my boss gave me a raise. And I said, Len, why do you do this? He says, because there has to be a differential between you and me. And we got to keep that differential. <laughs> so uh, it got to be where, uh, because I was in charge of safety, if there was a serious uh, injury, I would go to the doctor with the injured. And it got to be where the doctor and I were, were buddies, and, and I would assist him. In, some ways while he was stitching or uh, and I can remember one incident where there was a a head injury and he was administering uh, Novocaine and the needle bent on the hypodermic he looked at me and he said you better sit down <laughs> I was about to, to keel over because I saw this, but uh, while at Temple Steel, I paid everybody. So I knew everybody by name, and it got to be where uh, if a visitor came, they were turned over to me. And I was the one who escorted them through the plant from receiving to testing the steel to the punch press department to the annealing department to the shipping department. And I knew everybody. So I was, what would I say? Uh, a valued employee. Then all of a sudden, one day, uh, 
I was called in to the uh, vice president of sales. He says, we're transferring you to inside sales. The, uh, the salesman who had the biggest accounts, who had uh, charge of the most sales, needed somebody to work inside. So uh, I was his assistant, and there were times when uh, he had, well, his customers were Ford, uh, Lease Neville, Delco, Fasco, all big companies who used a lot of our product. And when he was on the road and I'd get orders, I would take them to production control and see if I could fit them in to where the customer wanted them. And sometimes it was easy and sometimes it was difficult, but I did it in a, a reasonable way. I would go in and I would trade off things, whereas this fellow that I was working for would just raise hell. He would just scream at everybody and, and cause all kinds of problems. So this approach that you had of uh, getting well, I knew everybody. You knew everybody. Were those, were those skills or talents that you found or developed while you were in the, well, in the, in the service? At, at this point, I started looking for another job. So I sent out a couple of ads, uh, resumes to a blind ad. And I get an answer, and I have an interview, and I'm offered a job. So I go in, and I'm telling them that I'm leaving. You can't leave. I said, well, oh, I'm leaving. So uh, they said, tell your new employer, we've got to keep you for two more weeks. So I tell the new employer that I'm they're wanting me for, he says, that's all right. So the vice president in charge of sales comes to me or asks me to come into his office and closes the door and he says, I know why you're leaving. If this doesn't work out, get in touch with me. I'll get you back here somewhere else. But I stayed on the next job for 32 years. So, Dad, while you were at Temple, uh, I thought the story was kind of interesting about the Lippenzahners. Oh. So, T Temple, the guy who yeah, owns well, Steel, is also the Temple of Lippenzahner Stables. Do you, are you familiar up with that? Well, up, up in northern the, Illinois. Uh, and there's actually a story as to why the it's horses from constant. Austria to do the yeah, dance? Yeah, yeah. Well, the boss calls me in. I was in personnel, I still at this time, and he said, uh, I don't know, six trucks come in with horses. And uh, the boss says to me, take these truck drivers to the Brown Bear, which is a restaurant on North Clark Street. Sign my name to the check, and uh, we'll work something out. And he mentions to me, I am so thankful I don't have a board of directors that wouldn't let me do this. <laughs> so he has a farm in Wisconsin, and he wants these horses brought to his farm in Wisconsin. The truck drivers don't have authority to go into Wisconsin. I don't know how that works. So he wound up at Lake Forest and bought a farm west of Lake Forest. And his complaint about Lake Forest was, none of these people have a job. <laughs> they're, they're, they're living on trust funds. <laughs> so. Whatever happened, uh, the government said 
this horse thing was a hobby and not a business. And the uh, comptroller, with a fellow by the name of Tom Magner, somehow went to court and convinced the court that this was part of the business, not a hobby. And so uh, Tom Magner uh, uh, and I became very friendly. And it, it's sort of funny. My uh, youngest son, uh, took the CPA exam and passed it and was offered a job with one of the big name uh, auditors. And I said to Tom, is this what he should do? And he said, even if it's for a year, he should do it. And uh, so he went to work uh, and he finally wound up answering a blind ad and became the uh, financial guy for a baseball uh, agency. Yeah, baseball so players, right. he wound up with a good deal. So, uh, b but before, and before you were even in service, you started working when you were really young, didn't you, Dad? What? You started working when you were really young. I mean, you, see, you mentioned that oh, you were, yeah, in well, 1945, you started was, working at Samuel Shanner. This was typical of our time. Uh, there was a, uh, a golf course called Big Oaks at the corner of uh, Narragansett and Gunnison. And it, was, I was, it, was it was across from what's Ridgemore. Ridgemore is still there. The from, other one. Uh, Ridgemore Country Club. And I was caddying there and uh, There was a fellow who was a dentist who was off on, the, the dentist didn't work on Wednesdays, so he played golf on Wednesdays, and he always asked for me to caddy. And his desire was to teach me how to play golf. So once we get out of sight of the first tee or to the second tee, we would play golf together, and it was sort sort of funny. He he enjoyed teaching me how to play golf, but then I heard that Tam O'Shanter needed caddies, and I left Big Oaks and went to Tam O'Shanter, and the caddy master at Tam O'Shanter was a uh, fellow by the name of Chassis, who heard that I was going to go to DePaul. He was a graduate of DePaul Academy. So the 45 Western Open was to be at Tam O'Shanter. And the caddy who was supposed to caddy for the Australian uh, champ, his name will come to me. Uh, was sick. So I was caddying for uh, the Australian champ on his practice round. And it amazed me at how accurate these guys were. Uh, I caddied around, he shot a 66 or a 67. And then we took a bag of balls and uh, he at the practice range, he'd say, sit on that rock. So I'd sit on the rock and he would hit balls to me and they'd all fall within 15 or 20 feet of me. Then I would bring the balls back to him and he'd say, sit to the left of that bush. And at the same thing, it, that would happen. But then another Tam O'Shanter story that, that's sort of funny. Tam O'Shanter had a reputation of having gangsters okay. in their membership. So I'm caddying and with these guys that I'm caddying with, from their conversation, I know they're gangsters. 
So I'm walking with these guys, and somebody hits a ball towards us, and it hits me in the leg. And the guy says, lay down and yell. So I lay down and yell. <laughs> The fellow that hit the ball came running over and says, what can I do? And he says, five bucks would make this kid feel a lot better. <laughs> <laughs> that was a day and a half's pay. <laughs> but uh, yeah. I, I, um, I sense we're coming toward the end of the, of the, of the very complete interview, uh, replete with details and a beautiful chronology. Your uh, command of the details and facts is very impressive. It make my job from this side uh, much easier than usual and more enjoyable. Um, but there's there's two questions that we there's two questions we usually ask the veterans as we approach the end of the interview. And one is, um, how do you think your military service and experiences affected your life? Uh, I enjoyed military service. It was uh, a diversion. Uh, didn't get shot at or anything. I, I had I had a job that was reasonably easy to do. Was respected by my peers, uh, and some of us still get together for lunch occasionally. Tim has been with us at lunch a couple times. Uh, so you were able to stay in touch with some well, of the other... basically, when we were called in, we were all from this area. A couple of guys from St. George High School, a couple of guys from Hippal, a uh, couple of guys from St. Ignatius, a couple of guys from Foreman High School, uh, a couple of guys from Steinmetz. So we were Chicago kids pulled into this thing and uh, came out reasonably well. And, uh, so you stayed in touch um, informally with yeah. the previous association, not VFW or American Legion or... No. 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 The other question is, um, how do you think your military experience influences your thinking about war or about the military in general? Well. There's there's a, a bumper sticker that I have on a dresser <laughs> at home. It says, United States Marine Corps, a few good men. Now, uh, war is miserable. You know, people get killed and maimed. Uh, but there are... for lack of a better word, tyrants who want uh, to acquire territory or they want to acquire the resources of a certain country and they're willing to put their, their youth at risk and, and go after these things. For instance, this guy, uh, Assad, who uh, is allegedly using chemical weapons, something has to be done to deter that kind of action. Now, uh, you know, at, at the present time, uh, Japan, uh, China is playing games with these, with this China Sea kind of thing, and they have to be deterred. Now, uh, our present administration doesn't understand this, but uh, 
we hope that it never comes to war and we hope that it never comes to atomic war. If, if there has to be a battle somewhere, let it be in some desert in Africa and let both sides fight it out and then come to some peace accord. Uh, that is fair to both sides. Do you think uh, compulsory military service would be a good idea? Military service. Or you could have an option of or, or something Peace Corps or similar. Yeah. Uh, what was it during the Depression? Uh, Civilian Conservation Corps or yeah. Works Progress? Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, you go out and cut trees down. National and, uh, service, yeah. yeah. Many of the vets so mention the, that, yeah. There is a... Uh, a history of you working for the public good. And uh, you meet new people. Uh, the uh, the present situation of the volunteers, uh, it seems, from what I've read, uh, mostly uh, poor people are going in because it's a job. And uh, you know, selective service uh, just puts you uh, in the military mostly the army, but at some point some of the service, some people were shoved into certain services and, and uh, I think most people come out better for it, but <laughs> there's, on, on my way home, uh, on the, before going overseas, uh, I had taken a flight from California to Ogden Field, in Hill Field in Ogden, Utah, to Denver. I couldn't get out of Denver on a plane. So I called home and said, send me some money. I'll get on a train. So I get on a train in uniform, sit down, and the fellow sits next to me and says, how do you like the Marine Corps? Well. You know, I've been in the Marine Corps for six, eight months, and uh, he says it made a bum out of my brother. <laughs> so, so <laughs> this fellow happened. Uh, there were there were two Air Force guys escorting a prisoner somewhere on this train, and he invited myself and these other three, the other three had vouchers, they, they couldn't go to dinner. So it worked out that this fellow was the family of Great Lakes Dredge and Dock. And he says, where are you going? And I says, we're going downtown. He says, you don't have to go downtown. The next time we, the train stops, call your family and tell them to meet you in Oak Park. Because then they, there's a place to park you're close to home, and you don't have to go downtown. So I thanked them for that and thanked them for the dinner, uh, but never never followed up on who he was or where he was. But a, a nice fellow whose brother got screwed up in the Marine Corps. <laughs> well, that's a very positive interview and a positive experience from a positive American. Um, Tim, is there anything we should... Your dad has covered all the questions. Um, yeah, I, I think it was interesting. I mean, the, yes, but you, you there was uh, lots of alcohol uh, overseas. Pilots were allowed a fifth a day. A fifth. A fifth. At a dollar fifty per fifth. So there was 
our captain who is in charge of our shop and four of us. So he was the kind of guy who says, every fifth day you can have a fifth of whiskey for a dollar fifty. I said, well, I can't drink that kind of whiskey. But I, I, in my mind, I said, I can sell it. So for a dollar fifty, I could sell it for five or six dollars and be ahead. And whoever got it, I find out was selling it again for something like ten dollars. And on and on it went. So probably twice or maybe three times when I was there, I would take a fifth of whiskey from the captain for a dollar fifty and sell it. Well, you also didn't smoke cigarettes either. I, you didn't smoke cigarettes either. No, oh, that's right. The <laughs> Swimmer, yeah. <laughs> we'd get a pack of cigarettes a day. And uh, soap, toothpaste, everything was handled by special services. And uh, nobody liked cools except the Koreans. So they would give me their cools, and I would sell them to the Koreans. <laughs> and all this time, I was putting money away, saving money to when I got home, because you didn't need money. On paydays, I would take 10 or $15, and that would last me till the next payday. And uh, one time in Japan, I was in the, uh, the USO or Army's hotel, and it was Sunday, and I asked, where do I go to Mass? And they pointed to a Catholic church down the street. So I went there to Mass, and uh, the priest was an Irishman, I could tell by his brogue. He said the Mass, it was the Mass in Latin, but the uh, sermon or homily was in Japanese, perfect Japanese. So after Mass, I went and talked to him, and he saw a lot of his friends from Ireland are now in Chicago and so forth, but uh, thanked me for coming to Mass. And Sort of, a, sort of a nice guy, but it, it, it was amazing that, you know, he, English, Latin, and Japanese, and he handled all, all of it well. Yeah. We're coming in for a perfect landing here, yes. about 80 minutes. Yeah, <laughs> So well done, uh, Mr. Smith. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Uh, yeah. Pleasure, Neil.